Good afternoon. I hope you have your Bibles and you would turn with me to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. What an honor it is to be here this afternoon to kind of culminate uh, what you have enjoyed since Thursday evening. And I do realize what a morning of preaching and teaching and some good food does. I realize that makes the eyelids heavy. And so we're going to fight that as we share, I think, one of the most beautiful and meaningful chapters in all of the Gospels. The exchange that our Lord has with these men that included the Apostle Peter. I'm honored to follow Brother Dan and honored to be here. Thankful for the elders asking me to be here, for Jeremy allowing me to share his pulpit. I Appreciate him and Chase and the great work they do here along with Butch and appreciate the great association we have together in the Georgia School of Preaching Biblical Studies. Brother Curtis asked me to do a sermon on evangelism. There's a lot of things we could do with that. We can talk about the parable of the sower in Luke 8, a number of other things. But I want us to look at John 21 because I believe this holds a key to our success as evangelists, whether we'll do it or not, whether we'll be involved in it or not in terms of the events that happened in John 21. Before we read a good bit of this chapter together, I'm sure you know in your study of the Bible that if we didn't have the book of John, there's a lot of material about Jesus that we would not have. We wouldn't have some of the teaching from chapter one about his preexistence as God the Word. We wouldn't have the exchange at the wedding feast at Cana of Galilee in chapter two where he changed the water into wine. We wouldn't have, out of John chapter 3, his exchange with Nicodemus about being born again of the water and of the Spirit. In chapters 4 and chapter 8, we wouldn't have the two exchanges there with the Samaritan woman and then the adulterous woman later on. Without chapter 11, we wouldn't have the account of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Without chapter 13, we wouldn't have the account of Jesus as the Rabboni, the exalted rabbi, washing his disciples' dirty feet number of things we wouldn't have. The precious promises that he begins to talk about in John 14 about heaven. And then that prayer, that high priestly prayer that he prays for those in his immediate presence then and also for each of us. So there's a, there's a ton of things that we need to be thankful for in that we have the book of John. Chapter 21 is a beautiful picture of kind of the finality of Jesus' exchange with a group of men that again included probably one of his most prominent apostles. You would have to say that about Peter. From Matthew chapter 4 verse 18, whenever the apostles are mentioned, Peter's always first. He was the first one to confess Jesus, Matthew 16. He's there at the transfiguration, Matthew 17, and also the exchange about the temple tax. Later on, he's there in Gethsemane and also in the praetorium as he follows Jesus to see the end in terms of him being crucified. These last several chapters from about chapter 14, maybe chapter 13, through about chapter 18, and then of course his death, burial, and then his resurrection, are the last hours that our Lord spends with these men that he's been closest to on earth for three years. I don't know if you've ever had a bedside encounter with someone who was precious to you who was still conscious enough to have an exchange with you. But if you have, you likely remember most every word that the two of you said to one another before the moment came. Well, here, Jesus has already died. He's been resurrected, and this is the third time he's presented himself to these folks. And yet, these words that he has for them are still precious. Let's begin reading the chapter in verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan, Galilee. The sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were with him or to, were together. You count that, I believe it's seven guys. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. That's an important point. We'll come back to it. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately out of the night they caught nothing. We've seen that before. Go back to Luke 5. 
But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. So he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. They'd seen that before too. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you've just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land. Two things the Holy Spirit says to us here. Number one, full of large fish. These weren't just minnows or shell crackers or brim. These were big fish. So this wasn't just some kind of a fishing accident. You know how sometimes guys will talk about the big one that got away and the more they tell it, the bigger the big one gets? These were large fish. When the Holy Spirit says that, you can, you can depend on the fact that they're big fish. Not only that, he tells us how many. There's 153. You tell me God doesn't know about numbers. And he isn't aware of every little hair on our head, Jesus said. Very hairs of your head are all numbered, he says. Amazing. And all there were, though there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Then Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now we go into the most, I guess, well-known exchange, the, the most well-known part of chapter 21. That's the exchange between Jesus and Peter. Where Jesus asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? I'm not here to throw cold water on other theories about why Jesus questioned him three times. We know from Luke 22, 31 through 34, that Peter had denied him three times. So a lot of folks say, well, he had to ask him these three questions or ask him the same question three times because of the three times of his denial. And that may be very valid. I want to present to you, though, a companion idea that I think sits well beside that and helps illustrate it even further as to why Jesus would have this exchange with Peter. Now let's read some more verses before we make that point. Now when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands. Another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he, that is Peter, would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will, that he remain till I come. What is that to you? You follow me. Number one, let's go back. I mentioned at the outset of reading the chapter that Peter had said to these other six guys, I'm going fishing. In verse 15, when Jesus says, Simon Peter, Simon son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? A lot of commentaries had a lot of different ideas about what he means. I submit to you, he's saying to Peter, Peter, do you love me more than your old life? Because what did Peter do in his old life? He's a fisherman. Do you love me more than these? Because Peter said, I'm going fishing. And the other guy said, we're going with you. Think about it again. They'd been with him for three years. They'd heard him teach that he was the Messiah. They had it in their minds, he's going to be a military Messiah who will bring armies and drive the Romans out of Palestine. He's not that kind of Messiah. But they'd been with him for three years. They had constant contact with him. They'd seen some amazing things that he had done. And then all of a sudden, 
He's dead. And all of these ideas, concepts, dreams, misinterpretations that they had, down the drain. So at that point in time, you can understand why Peter's kind of standing there going, okay, what, what next? What's now? What happens next? So with Peter being the kind of guy he was, opening his mouth sometimes before he engaged his brain, he said, I'm going back to what I know. I'm going back to what I know. Let's drive down a peg here. When a Christian who's put his or her hand to the plow turns their back on that decision and goes back to the world, you know what they find? The same empty hole that Peter and these six guys found when they went fishing. They find nothing. And if you and I put our hands to the plow and say, I'm going to follow Christ, I'm going to live my life for him, and if necessary, I'm going to die for him, that's what Peter said. And we go back to that, like, like we're disillusioned with the church, or we're disillusioned with something that, that's going on in our Christian lives, and, well, it's better if I go back to my old life. No, it isn't. And you'll find the same empty, fished out, empty bucket that you left when you went into a baptistry like this one behind me and obeyed the gospel. Don't let Satan deceive us to think that somehow the world we came from is better than the one we are in following Christ. Because if we do that, if we teeter-totter between the old life and this life, we'll never be an influence on anyone else to come out of their old life and be a new creature in Christ because we're, we're still straddling the fence. And in 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22, Peter talked very graphically about what it's like for someone after they've tasted the heavenly gift to go back into the corruption of this world. He says it's like a dog, what now? Returning to his vomit. And a sow from her washing, washing to the wallowing again in the mire. You think maybe Peter had some feeling of what that was when he says here, I'm going back. Going back's not the answer. Then let's look at this exchange a little further. This is point number two. Here we have an exchange where Jesus asked him three times if you love me and Peter answers three times you know that I love you. In the English language, we have a very benign thought pattern usually. We can use one word for several different things and, and there's little distinction. Let me give you an example. We love cars. We love dogs, we love food, we love baseball, we love America, we love our mothers, we love our daddies, we love our girlfriends and our boyfriends. We love a lot of stuff. But is that love the same in every circumstance? The Greek's not like that, thankfully. The Greek is far more uh, uh, deep and rich and, and defined. It's a more precise language. Someone, and, and one of my professors at Fred Harvard University used to say, the difference between knowing Greek and not knowing Greek is the difference between watching black and white TV and color TV. Image is the same, basically. But one is, a, is so much richer than the other. How many of us would go down here to Walmart or some of these appliance stores and we'd see, man, we see these beautiful flat screen color TVs and this one black and white TV over here and we'd say, that's the one for me. Wouldn't do that. There are two Greek words that are used in this exchange. The word, the word agapao. It is the word from which we get agape. Agapao means to sacrificially love somebody. That means even if they treat you like a worm, you still love them. It's not a hot flash, passionate, kind of on and off, up and down kind of love, but rather it is a commitment in the intellect and the heart that says, I am going to sacrificially love you. 1 John 4, 8 and 16, the Bible says God is love. The word there is agapao. That's who God is. He sacrificially loves us. He loves us when we don't care a flip about him. That's what agapao is. The other word, phileo. It's a friendship kind of love. We hear that. It literally means, I like you. I'm fond of you. And if I can put it in a little more current, I guess, vernacular, I think you're a neat guy. I really like you. So let's go back and plug these in. Verse 15, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agapao me? Peter, do you sacrificially love me? Would you die for me? That's the implication. 
Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. <laughs> you know I really like you. I'm really fond of you. Those are two different things, aren't they? Second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agapao me? He said, yes, Lord, you, you know that I phileo you. I really like you. I'm fond of you. I think you're a neat guy. So the third time, Jesus switches. Simon, son of Jonah, you can almost hear him say it. Do you phileo me? Do you really like me? Are you fond of me? You think I'm a neat guy? Peter confirms it. He's grieved, but he said, you know, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. Here's the point. It's one thing to really, really like Jesus. It's one thing to say, man, I think he's the neatest guy. He raises people from the dead. He walks on water. He feeds the 5,000 with a few little fish and, and some loaves. Man, I think he's neat. That's a whole different arena of love than to say and to prove through our actions, I die for you. And notice what Peter says, to, or Jesus says to Peter each time. He said, if you do love me, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. In other words, Peter, don't make these bold declarations. In John 15, verse 13, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. So there's a big difference between the two. He's trying to get Peter from this position of, boy, I really like you, to, to really understanding what it means to agapao him. Because the third point, and that's where it's really proven, most assuredly, he says, verse 18, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. When you're old, you'll stretch out your hands, and other will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he, that is Peter, would glorify God. Peter, your death's going to glorify me. And we know from history, not from Scripture, from history, not from Scripture, that it was said that Peter chose to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy because of these denials of the Lord and, and the, the frailty or the sinfulness that he saw in his own life. He just didn't feel like he deserved to be upright like the Lord was. So evidently he did die and glorify God. But again, the Lord's message to him was this. Peter, you're going to be called to die for me. You had better straighten out in your head how you feel about me. And instead of making all of these, again, these bold declarations... Matthew 26, verses 33 and 35. Listen to what Peter says. Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will never deny you. Verse 35, even if I have to die with you, I'll not deny you. Luke twenty two thirty three. 33, Lord, I am willing to go with you both to prison and to death. And after Jesus had washed their feet, Peter says, I will lay down my life for your sake. If we took a survey this afternoon about how we feel about certain things in our own lives, many of us would answer it like this. Would you die for your family? Yes. Would you die for your country? Yes. Any number of other things you could mention. Would you give your life? Yes. But would you take off from a fishing trip to come and knock doors on Saturday morning with the local congregation? Now, son, you don't quit preaching and going to meddling now. Would you sacrifice an 8 o'clock tea time on Saturday morning or in the deer stand in the fall because your wife wants you to be home, have breakfast with her on Saturday because you don't ever get to spend any time with each other? You see, it's easy for us to stand and say, I'd die for this. But will we make the small sacrifices? 
That's the point. Because we won't make the big ones unless we learn how to make the big ones by making the smaller sacrifices. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, you die for me? Tend my sheep. Feed my lambs. Do the little mundane things that don't seem so grandiose as standing up and saying, man, I would die. And quit making those declarations. And again, Peter, just do it. Because you see, when, when love is at the depths of agapao, you don't have to make a declaration. And nobody has to make you take an exam to prove it. During World War II, many concentration camps that were operated by Nazi Germany had a, an iron sculpture over the front gate. And in German it said, Erbach mark frei, work will set you free. And that was a lie. It was a, it was a propaganda message to those coming into those labor camps, those prison camps, that if you will come in and you'll work really, 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 really hard, We'll turn you loose. We'll set you free. In one of those particular camps, there was a family, read about not long ago, their last name was Rosenberg. A Jewish family of a father, mother, two little boys, 12-year-old boy, and a five-year-old brother who had polio. And he would never walk. Crippled from birth. They stayed at a particular prison camp where the commandant would allow families, as they stayed in those long dormitories, they would allow families to stay in one little section or pod over here together, which a lot of the camps wouldn't. But this commandant had at least some sort of semblance of compassion for families. Or maybe it was for some other reason he thought he could get more out of the ones who could work out of the family if they could stay together. Anyway, as long as one person in that family and that concentration camp could work, the rest of the people in the family would be spared. One particular day, Mr. Rosenberg went on a work day tale. Late that evening around sundown, he came back, got off the truck, went into the dorm. And there was his 12-year-old boy sitting on the cot and weeping. The father went over and sat down next to him and he embraced him and he said, son, what's wrong? He called his little brother's name and he said, Father, while you were gone, they came and took him to the ovens. So they both wept. And as the father was drying his son's tears and trying to pull back his own, He said, where's your mother? The little boy began to weep again, called his little brother's name, said, mother couldn't stand the idea of him going to the ovens alone. So she went too. She went too. Jesus could not stand, nor our Heavenly Father could stand, the idea of those of us created in His image spending an eternity in torment when something could be done about it. And Jesus says to Peter, Peter, you're going to die for me. And you are. You're going to have to love me more than you do. And then if that's not enough, Peter begins to look around at John. After Jesus says simply, follow me, verse 19, which is the same thing he said to him way back in Matthew 4, 18. Peter turns around and he sees John. He's the one who leans on Jesus' breast and asks, you know, who's the one that betrays you? So Peter, seeing John over here, looks at Jesus and he says, but Lord, what about this man? What about, what about this man? And Jesus says, if he remains until I come back, 
What is that to you? You follow me. In other words, Peter, put your eyes on me. Get your eyes on me. Stop worrying about what John is doing. John's not the foundation of your faith. You know, sometimes in our desire, in our doing evangelism, trying to help people come out of denominationalism into the one true church, the body of Christ, we do a better job seemingly converting them to the church than we do to Christ. And what happens is that when they see imperfection or flaws in the lives of people who are in the church, every one of us, because we all sin fall short of the glory, and we all need the blood of Jesus, the whole foundation of their faith is shattered and they leave because they think all we are is a bunch of hypocrites. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, don't worry about John. That's not your business. You follow me. You keep your eyes on me. And brethren, I want to say to you today, for us to be able to do evangelism and do it effectively, to know that there are four kinds of soil out there and one of them's only one of them is any good, but the seed that we sow in that soil and the, the watering that we do, God brings it up. It's God's power, not ours. But there has to be a love in our hearts, not only for our brethren, not only for our Lord, but for those who would go to torment out there without this message, and without the obedience that they must render. I mean... We don't have all the time in the world. I must work the works of him, him who sent me while it's day. The night comes when no man can work, Jesus said, John 4, 9, 4. He's trying to get the same message across to Peter. Peter, if you love me, get busy. Don't go over here and occupy yourself throwing a net in the water again and trying to do what you did in your former life. Do what I've called you to do. That's the only way you'll get the message out. It's the only way you'll give these people who, who would be good soil it's the only way you'll give them a chance. You gotta have a passion for it, Peter. You gotta keep your eyes on me. And you can't be, keep going back and forth and back and forth saying, boy, I'll do this, and then you do something else. We gotta be like the shoe company that sit, sends two shoe salesmen salesmen out at different times to a particular territory. They sent the first one, and after a few weeks, you've heard, the, you've heard this illustration, I'm sure, after a few weeks, he hadn't sold the thing. He called the shoe company back and said, this is the worst territory in the world. I'm quitting. Nobody here wears shoes. Everybody goes barefooted. So he just sent all his product back and sent all his paperwork back and just quit. And they said, well, we got to try again. So they hired another guy and sent him out there, and within two weeks' time, he was sending in record Orders for shoes. I mean, just blowing the top out of it. So they called him and they said, man, what's going on out there? He said, everybody here needs shoes. He had a passion for it because he realized the other side, he realized that glass was half full, not half empty. He said, everybody needs this message. Everybody needs these shoes. That's the way they have to be. That's the way that Jesus was trying to get Peter to see it. And you don't have to have a PhD to do that. I mean, you think, about, you think about the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. The rich man's in torment. It doesn't say that he had any kind of theological education or rabbinical education, but in torment, as he's in torment, he's asking for some kind of relief. When he realizes he's not going to get it, what does he ask of Abraham? Send Lazarus. All of a sudden, he's interested in evangelism. Send Lazarus back to my house. I got five brothers. They don't need to come here. You see, that's the message. There's one who can deliver you from that place and only one. And you and I have to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, Mark 12, verse 30. We have to love him in the same way that Jesus is trying to get Peter to see it. And to keep our eyes off everything else, to keep from being distracted by the world and follow him. I may have told you before as I conclude today I may have told you before about a brother in Christ who's now gone on to be with the Lord. I hope you meet him one day. You'll be blessed if you do. Brother Clyde Carson was a man that had about a fourth grade education. He never went any higher in school than that. He made mops and brooms. He had a little shop out behind his house where he made mops and brooms. And boy, he made some good ones. I still have one of his brooms from about 45 years of having received it from him. Good brooms and mops. But Brother Clyde, other than doing brooms and mops, 
had two things that he did for the Lord really well. Benevolence and personal evangelism. Man, he was the best there was. Benevolence and personal evangelism. On one occasion, a young man that I know was sitting at home playing his guitar, getting ready for a gig that night. Brother Clyde called the house. This was after, significantly after, a year or so or more that Brother Clyde spent with this young man's father while he was still a drunkard and taught him the gospel to the point that this man, young man's father became a Christian and never went back to the bottle. This afternoon, Brother Clyde called and he said, yes. He said, is David at home? And bless my mother's heart, she said, yes, he is. Do you need him for something? Mama, why in the world you do that? He'll be ready in just a few minutes. You come right on by. He pulls up in his Econo line van. We get in the van and take off. He doesn't say a word about where we're going. We go to a local grocery store. We get two carts. We go through the grocery store and we fill those carts up, heaping over. And a lot of stuff in there was for, I mean, his young helper was not a rocket scientist, but he could see that a lot of this stuff was for a child. Formula and other things, diapers, things like that. So when they got up to the checkout counter and they pulled all that stuff off on the belt and they rolled it down there, man, it was, I don't know, over $200. And this was in 76. That's a lot of groceries in 76. Brother Clyde doesn't reach for a church check. He pulls a big old wad of money out of his pocket and just peels off some hundreds. His money. Not a church check. His money. Put all the bags inside the Econo line van and take off and finally he explains to his young apprentice what's going on. He said, there's a young family whose baby is dying. They have a two-year-old baby girl around the age of two and she has an inoperable brain tumor and there's nothing else they can do. And this young family, these two young parents are staying at home with her because they're just counting the days and hours until her time comes. So we get to the little garage apartment and we you know, hump those groceries up the stairs and put them on the counter and the the young father's standing there. He's in his 20s and, and he's standing there and he begins to cry. In a few minutes, the mother comes out of the bedroom and she's carrying that precious little girl in her arm. And that inoperable brain tumor had already grown out her eye socket and it was sitting out here on the side of her head. Ugly and grotesque. So pitiful. She's so precious. So we all stand there and we just cry. And in a few minutes, Brother Clyde, he says, now these groceries will hold you for a little while. And he said, when these run out, you know, you got rent to pay and other things. I know you're not working. You need to be home with your baby. He pulled that big wad of money out and he said, use that and when that runs out, let me know and we'll get you some more. But he said, we've got something that's far more important than that though that we want to leave with you. He said, when your little girl finally leaves this world, he said, she's going to be just fine. Said she'd be escorted by the angels into Abraham's bosom. She won't hurt anymore. And she's going to be with the Lord forever. He said, and if you want to go and see her again, then we've got something else we want to leave with you. As a matter of fact, we don't want to just leave it with you. We want to come back and study it with you. Because this and your obedience of this is the only way you'll ever see her again. They agreed to a study. We left, got back to the house. His young apprentice tries to scramble out of the van as quick as he can. Brother Clyde grabs the shoulder. He said, do you know what we just did? 
Yes, sir. I, we tried to help a young family. He said, well, yeah, we did that. But here's what we really did. We opened the door for the gospel. That's what we did. And if those two young people will study and they'll become Christians, we open the door for them to eternity this afternoon. He said, now, young man, go and do likewise. Put away all the other foolish stuff that you think is going to make your life so grand. And you go and make a difference in somebody else's eternity. That's what evangelism is. That's what the sharing of the good news is. It's not just to stand up and show what we know or refute this argument or that argument. It's to open the door for someone to spend eternity with God. And that's the most precious gift that anybody's ever given us. Amen? Most precious thing we, we bring to a place like this and then take away from it is eternal life. That living water that Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman about. This afternoon, I want to encourage you, as Peter was encouraged... To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. To get your eyes off everything else in this world that you think matters and get them on the Lord and keep them there. And if you make up your mind that you, that you want your death to glorify God, then make sure your life glorifies Him by being someone who would share this with everybody you meet. Mark 16 is so beautiful. As you go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That's as easy to do as walking out this door and driving home. Would you do it? Because you love somebody else more than yourself. If you need to respond to the invitation today to become a Christian or to come back and be a faithful Christian again to repent of sin that's taking you away from your relationship with God, Take advantage of this opportunity and come while together we stand and sing. I am mine, no more. I am mine, no more. I live on with